Okay, let's talk about the church this morning. Our focus as the church has to be what the church was supposed to be. And I will tell you that my generation, my generation, the boomers, I don't claim to be one very often, but I'll just, this morning I'll say, yeah, I am. We got off, okay? The handoff that we had from the church that we received kind of sort of doesn't look like the church we received. My generation did this, I will just say wrong, okay? And what we have done wrong, we have commingled things like politics into the midst of the church. And we've gotten off the pure word of the gospel of Jesus Christ when we mixed our politics into it. We got off when we started mixing things like positive thoughts. Right? There are churches now, I cannot get over what I see on Twitter. There are people my age who are mixing things with, quite frankly, our new age. They're, t they're quoting new age stuff and rep trying to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ. And well, that is not right. So we got off on that. All right? We've also got off in the way that we do church. And so with that, there's just a host of things that have happened. And I think because of that is why, if you ask, if you take a survey, 30% of everybody, if you take everybody, put everybody in a circle, and you took a survey and said, what do you think about the church? I will tell you that statistically, 30% of those people say, church? I, I don't need church. What's church got to offer me? And I will tell you, I think that's because we got off. The church that my generation was handed, we messed it up. So I'm taking it as part of my personal responsibility to get it right. So if I sound really matter-of-fact, or if I sound forthright this morning, it's because I am. All right? So, and because uh, I just want you to know, if, and I, you've heard me say this, Probably every January for a few years I've said this. If this fellowship is going to survive, if we are going to keep going, this is the only way we're going to keep going, is to be focused and to be dominant on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Because if we compromise it in any way, God's going to have no use for us. I'm just telling you straight up. If we compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's got no use for a fellowship like that. And that's why you see so many anemic, powerless churches. They're name-only churches. They don't function in the way Jesus wanted us to function. Are you with me? Amen. We have to not be that way. So that's why we've said this week, the week of the 21st, we're praying and fasting for the church. We're praying and fasting for our fellowship. And, as some of you have noted, when you start praying and fasting, the devil is not happy. Amen. And he's going to mess you over multiple times. He's going to mess with you, mess with your head. That's how he... See, I have so much windshield time, he messes with my head. Oh, Steve, by the way. And I, by the time I get to where I'm going, if I don't stay focused, I'll be... A, I'll be I, he can mess me over. But he'll mess us over physically. He'll mess us over with flat tires. He'll mess us over with all kinds of stuff just to get us off task. That's exactly what he does. And then he gets really mean. And he'll start throwing things into our life that we don't want there. That's because we say we're going to pray fast. He said, I don't want that. So if I can stop him from doing it, let me stop him from doing it. Let me play a head game with him. Let me play, mess him over a little bit to get us off task. Happens all the time. I'll tell you, it happens every time. The New Testament is very clear on what the church is supposed to be, what we're supposed to be doing, who we are supposed to be representing, and how we need to interact with the culture in which we've been placed. In other words, we're supposed to influence the culture. The culture is not supposed to be influencing the church. Are you with me? We're supposed to be influencing the culture. We're supposed to be depositing good into the culture. We're not supposed to be trying to rep, bring the culture in here so they go, oh, see, they'll think we're just like them. We're not supposed to be like them. If we're going to be like them, they go, well, what do I need the church for? I can get that without going to church. Why do I, I don't need that. Right? right? 
And so with that, if we're not going to be different, Jesus says, I don't really have a use for you. You have to represent me in your time. So, I found this from the commentary. Dr. Tony Evans. I quote Dr. Tony Evans a lot because I've listened to a lot of different people. I've listened to a lot of different preachers. I'm not saying anything bad about anybody else. But I'm telling you, he's the only one who says the stuff that I think is absolutely spot on 100% of the time. Okay? When it comes to things like this, like the church, how we're supposed to operate, how we're supposed to represent him. He said this. He said, Matthew 16, 18 is where Jesus first used the word church. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. The Greek word translated church is ekklesia. Ecclesia. And what ecclesia is, is a called out group of people whose purpose is not just to be called out, to walk around and go, I'm called out. They're called out with a purpose and the purpose is to represent the one who called them. Are you with me? Amen. So if we want to make a difference. We need to represent the one who has called us out. Who called you out? Jesus. Absolutely. He is the one who's called us out. If we're going to make any kind of difference at all, he's the one we have to represent. And it's one of those things I remember my mom saying. I told you this before. I don't care what the other kids are doing. You're not going to do that. We're not doing that in this house. And I'll just tell you that. I don't care what the other churches are doing. I don't care what the other churches are saying. There's a lot of them like us that are saying, hey, we just want to represent the gospel of Jesus Christ in our time. And it doesn't matter what the rest of them are doing. If they're not doing it, it doesn't matter. Are you with me? I'm not saying it to be mean. I'm just saying it doesn't matter what they're doing. We have to do that because that's what Jesus said for us to do. Right? Right. right. What we do in the church, what we do through the church, should make his name great, not our own name great. As individuals who are saved, as individuals who are sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, you and I are on God's mission, not our own. Right? Well, we should be on God's mission. <laughs> we should be on God's mission and not our own. But the question is, if you're sitting there thinking, what is God's mission? Here's God's mission. To reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is centralized through his church. There is no other way the world's going to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ except through his church. That is us. That is you and me. We should be focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the good news that brings salvation to each person. And every person needs change. Every person needs salvation. I know people, you know people, we all know people go, I'm a good person. And I'm not saying you're not a good person. I'm saying, are you going to be with God in heaven for eternity? Because even the good people who don't connect themselves to Jesus Christ are going to miss God for eternity. Right? Amen. So, we have a problem today, though. Here's our problem today. The problem with the definition of the church, and I thought long and hard about what I want to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. All right. <laughs> and I don't mean anything hard by it, okay? I don't mean harsh by it. I'm just telling you, this is my generation, the church we were handed, we did it wrong. We handed it to everyone who's younger wrong, all right? And because we handed it to everybody who we did, by and large, okay, there's still the Philadelphian church out there, there's hot spots where God is on fire in the people, okay? And I want that to be us, right? Amen. That's who we want to be. But here's what happens. There's too many people today, this is my definition, okay? There's too many people who identify today as Christian and they have the wrong view of what the church is and the wrong view of what the church is supposed to be doing. Because to some people, the church is a building. And the nicer the building, the nicer the church. Right? That's how we think. Oh, that's a brand new church. And they have a gym. <laughs> or a swimming pool. A cement pond. <laughs> we get all, all worked up about how it looks. And we want it to be nice. I want stuff to be nice, too. We get all worked up about the building, except what's, not, what's happening inside the building. Right? Sometimes the physical blessing of the building becomes the greater focus than the blesser who gave you the building to begin with, right? Yeah. That's what happens. My generation did that. Okay, so I'm, I'm throwing me out the front of the line first, okay? Here's the other one. Sometimes
Sometimes the church is a, so so some people the church is a building. Sometimes the church is just a blessing. Now, understand, don't hear what I'm not saying. The church is supposed to be a blessing, right? Are you with me? But sometimes all people want is the blessing. We had a Wednesday night Bible study one night. And some lady called like 20 minutes before we were start start. She was in champagne. She's telling me she needed $100. Well, ma'am, do you realize you're in Monticello? Well, yeah, and she wasn't taking no for an answer. Okay. And finally, I said, ma'am, I'm 20 miles away from you. Where are you calling her? She said, I'm on North Prospect Avenue. I said, I can tell you there's that. I named her church. Boom, 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 boom. Right there, right within a mile of where you at. Have you called them? Well, truth was, she was playing me, okay? But, because she hadn't called them, she didn't, had no desire to call them. So here's what happens. Sometimes what people want from the church is $100. That's all they want. They want Jesus Christ, they just want their $100. Because they think, let me say this right so I don't say that. <laughs> the church should be a blessing, but sometimes all they want is their is there hundred dollars? Some people see the church as a place where they they need a hundred dollars. They should go. They're going to go to the church and give them a hundred dollars because they think they need a hundred dollars. And this church should give them a hundred dollars because that's what I need. And what kind of church are you that wouldn't give me a hundred dollars? And I'll put it this way: This is first first person. I've had people tell me you're a terrible pastor because you won't do what I tell you to do. You ain't all that. <laughs> <laughs> Through texts and phone calls. Um, <laughs> and it's like, okay. Um, yes, we should help. But we need to be prudent. Because the person that Peter met was looking for money. Peter said, I don't have any money to give you. What I do have, I'll give you. Rise up and walk. Well, he wasn't looking for a rise up and walk. He was looking for a handout that day. But the church, what we have is Jesus Christ. And the interplay, the thing that we should leave with someone, is what we know he can do to change lives. $100 might help him for a day. $20 might help him for an hour. Depending on if it's liquid that they need or powder. Right? Yeah. Amen. I'm just calling them spade a spade at this point. Some of you do who don't come on Wednesday night. This is the version of me you get on Wednesday nights. <laughs> so, so it's like, I can't hold this back. So the problem is, is that the definition of the church is all messed up. As long as we know who we are here, right? If we know who we are here, we are the church of Jesus Christ. He is our head and he has changed us and we are his representatives in our time. That is who we are. And if we go do that, he will lead us to the right places. He will show us the right things to do. And when somebody really does need $100, we'll help them, right? Amen. Yeah. Okay. If that needs more definition, if I've confused anybody, hit me up afterwards and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. Because the church is supposed to get involved with people. Ecclesia is a gathering. It's a gathering of people to come together. And, and, and it's a gathering of people to come together, not only to worship on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, it's a gathering of people to come together to get fired up and to get connected so that when we leave here, we go to what? Try to connect other people to Jesus Christ. Are you with me? That is why we're here. The New Testament is very clear on what the church is. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, it says that. If you found that, I'm going to read that for you. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they were continually, continually devoting. Ooh, underline those two words. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they, who they? All those people. All those people, all those people began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. 
They didn't even have a good building. Those people met in the street. That very first time, the very first worship of the church was in the street. And you know where they met after that? House to house. House to house. And it wasn't the church that had any money because the church didn't have any money. Who was, set, who was selling their stuff and giving it away? The people were. Were they part of the church? Yes, they were part of the church. But this is where this, and I'm just, one little point, this is where this gets mixed up. Well, the church should give me $100 because I need $100. Well, actually, it was the people who sold their stuff and helped other people. Right? I know that hurts, but I'm just saying this is the truth. So they were celebrating the things that were happening to people. And there's four things that were happening there. You see what they did? They say, they, they were, look at that verse there, verse uh, 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. That's the word of God. Fellowship is ministry. They were life on life. You can't do church right unless you're life on life. And that's not Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Starts at Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. It goes, it actually happens when we leave this place. Are you with me? Amen. It's everybody walks in the Circle K. It's everybody I run into. It's, it's conversations that happen at work. It's wherever we go, standing in line buying something. It's some, it, God will send you somebody, and I'm telling you as I live and breathe, He's going to send you somebody that you need to share the gospel with. It'll happen a lot if we're focused on that. And so with that, we need to be ready because you might be, you might be, the one person that somebody needs to hear about Jesus Christ from. You might not even know that person. I was waiting to get my oil changed the other day. Sitting in there at Rick Ridings, waiting to get my oil changed. And there was a guy sitting in there. And I just, you know, I talked to everybody. I talked to everybody. And so, sitting there talking to him. And one thing led to another. And he started talking. And we started talking. And he said something. And he threw me a line. And when they throw me a line that sounds like I'm talking about Jesus Christ, man, I will bite on that every time. And so, so I started talking. And before we were done, we were talking. I found out he's a deacon in his church. And he told me, and I don't know why people do this. He said, yeah, but I, I, I need to live. I just need to be living a better life. This was before I told him I was a pastor. So I said, well, dude, what's holding you back? What, 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 what's stopping you right now from living what you know you're supposed to be doing? Well, 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 I know. I said, well, why is that road blocking you? I said, God will tear that road block down. <laughs> this is exactly what I said to him. I said, God will tear that road block down. Why don't you, why don't you let him tear that road block down? <clears throat> and anyway, at that, it was in that moment, he, he looked at me, he said something, I said, well, actually, I'm a pastor. And it was like, that. All the, all the walls broke down then. It's like, okay, that's why you're talking like this. But we should talk like that whether you've got pastor in front of your name or not. Because what? We're all kingdom priests, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're called multiple time kingdom priests in the kingdom of God, and we're out representing him. So wherever we go, whatever we do, we need to be ready to give an account of the Word of God and Jesus Christ and the Gospel, because the Gospel is the only thing that's going to change people. People are so messed up right now, and I get there's all kinds of things that can help, but you know what? Sometimes when, you've got it, when you go beyond the physical, it's the spiritual stuff that people are getting messed up with, right? Amen. Yeah. And if you don't fix the physical, you can't bring, what's the line? You can't bring a knife to a gunfight. You can't bring physical solutions to a spiritual problem. And so we, God's people, his kingdom priests, have to help someone get to the place where they can really get help. And that's a spiritual help. Not that there's not physical help needed. But there are spiritual help that they need. So, the church is people. The church is not a building. The church is not a program. The word church is not a worship service. And if you'll notice, if you pay close attention, I quit using the word service. I just say we come to worship. Because a service is something altogether different in my mind. So, worship is what we do on Sunday morning, in my mind. And the church is not a social organization. The church is a gathering of followers of Jesus Christ based on their willingness to allow Him backstage access to your life and mine. The deeper you want, you want to go deeper with Him, give Him backstage access to your life. Where nobody except special people with lanyards get to go, right, in the concerts? 
Oh, they've got a land here. They can come back there and meet and with the meet and greet, right? Well, God wants to meet and greet with you and me. And you're the only one who's going to be able to let him back there. He will not break the door down. If it says no admittance, if you've got a lot uh, signed up in your life that says no admittance, guess what? He's going to go, okay, I'll wait. That's why he's at the door knocking. Will you let me in? you let me in, man. I'll come and eat with you. I'll come and dine with you. We'll hang out together. But you've got to let me in. People are going, oh, I can't let it backstage. <clears throat> if you want difference, let it backstage. Because that's how he changes us. The job of the church isn't to adopt the values of the culture. The job of the church is to take heaven's values and place them in the culture in which we live, how we live every day. So that people see us do what we say we believe. Are you with me? Amen. People can see God at work in your everyday life. Man, I'm having a hard day today. Might be the catalyst for somebody going, I am too. Might be the catalyst that said, I'm going to trust God for it. I'll trust Him. So, if we could ever see God's kingdom, if we could ever see His church ever see God's kingdom the way He sees it, if we could ever see one another as He sees us, individuals to come together, unify with the goal of His overarching kingdom agenda, if we could do that, then the world would deal with the full strength of the church of Jesus Christ. If we could do that, we would be so powerful, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. There are churches who do that. There are kingdoms, or uh, 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 people, uh, kingdom priests who do that. I'm just saying, that's what I want for us. That's who we need to be. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. The church is the ecclesia, the gathering of people. Love this. When... In 2014, I've never told this story. In 2014, and we were coming back here. So it was in the summer, and we'd already decided we were moving back here. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. We're moving back. And I knew that God was what God was doing in my life. And so it was on, I remember the day, and Jeremy was here. And Jeremy called me when I was out burning stuff from the garage. He said, I'm not moving this stuff back. I'm leaving it here in ashes. I'm leaving this stuff. I'm not carrying this stuff back with me. And I'm out talking to Jeremy on the phone that day. And I started this little fire. It was a nice day, but it started little. And it's like, I, and I kept coddling this fire trying to get it to go. Because I was going, I was having me a real burning party of all kinds of papers and stuff. And in that moment, God spoke to me and said, see, it takes a little time to get that fire going. You got it. You got if you work the front end of the fire, if you work the fire early and really get it hot, when you start adding stuff to it, it gets hotter. But you gotta work the front end and you've got to be patient. You can't just get it all at once. Anybody start a fire, you know that's true, right? You kind of gotta get it, you gotta get it started. And he was using that moment to share it with me and to say, you're just going to have to let me do in you, right? And so I, I bring that fire example to the table because ecclesia, the gathering of people, is like the gathering of woods. You can grab all kinds of wood. i got wood sitting out in front of the house there that I use for having a good fire. And I love a good fire, and I love how it smells, and I love sitting there hearing it pop and crackling and all that. I love a good fire. You can get all that stuff together in one place and set it there and wait, and nothing's going to happen, right? Because something's got to light it up. Something's going to have to light that up. And with that, the church, sometimes we get this wrong. We come to a really nice building, and we have a really nice, and I will use the term this time, service. We have a really nice service with really nice music, and everybody looks perfect, and everything's perfect. And you know what? You walk out of there and go, I'm not sure I feel anything. I don't feel anything. It was nice. I just don't feel anything. Well, why didn't you feel anything? Because there wasn't anything there to light it up. Because somebody got forgot to get invited to that service. You know who that was? The Holy Spirit. Is it the Holy Spirit 
that will light us up. Now, it's kind of interesting. Go to Acts, go to the beginning of Acts chapter 2 there, verse, verse 1. So how this whole thing started with them, I hope is how it continues to run with us. And here's how it started with them. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the day of Pentecost, when Pentecost had come, and that was also on a Sunday. Jesus rose on a Sunday, and Pentecost was on a Sunday. That's why we worship on Sunday. So day of Pentecost had come, and they were all together in one place. See, they had gathered together. They had gathered together. What were they doing? Waiting for something to light them up. Verse 2, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them as tongues of fire, distributing themselves, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utters. Why did they, God equip them in that way? Because there's a bunch of people from other countries out there in the street that were going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was using those people. No, I'm gonna, you, you go out and speak what I want you to speak. I'll take care of the rest, is what he said. What's interesting, go, go down to verse 12. So the Holy Spirit lighted those people up. Or I'm going to use, I'm going to misuse some grammar, okay? Just work with me, all right? But they, those, the Holy Spirit lit them up. Look at verse 12. Verse 12, there were people accusing them, and I'm going to use the strict term, accusing them of being lit. And I mean that in the alcoholic sense, right? So verse 12 said, some sneered and said they were drunk with new wine. See, they were accused of being lit, if I can use that term. And they really were lit, but they were lit with the Holy Spirit. And because they were lit with the Holy Spirit, I know grammatically that's incorrect, just work with me. Because they were lit with the Holy Spirit, though, is because he gave, they gave him full access. And he made them hot for him. There's no fire I've ever started that you don't touch. Right? Or you can't touch it because it's hot, right? Because you will get burned. Well, these people were hot for the Lord. Because those people gathered together in that place and said, we want you to visit us, Lord. You told us to do this. He told you. He said, go there and wait. You just wait. Wait for me. And because they did what he said to do, the Holy Spirit visited them. And what became of that group? 120 people became 3,000 by the end of Peter's talking there. 3,000 were added that day. 3,000 people. Because 120 people says, I want to do this God's way. 120 is not very big, is it? Compared to 3,000. So I want to do this God's way. So they gathered together. Life on life. And when life on life and the Holy Spirit ignites people, that is when God can do great work. What happens? Let me just ask you a question. Who, who are the great, the great fire campfire starters here? Raise your hand. Got, I got one fire starter here. I know you're a good fire starter over here. I always think I have a good fire. Jared, I look at Jared and his is going like this. I'm going, oh man, that's a good fire. What happens when you have a good fire going, you got everything stacked up? If you were to take one of those logs and set it aside, what happens to that? You fire people. When you take it off the fire, Rusty, what happens to it? It still burns. It kind of depends if there's snow on the ground. That's true. Yes. <laughs> it keeps burning, but it's slower. Yeah. And, and eventually, if it doesn't get back to the group, what happens to it? Then it dies out. Okay. Again, I'm not pouring guilt on anything. I'm just saying. Do you know the only way that we can stay hot for the Lord is to stay in the ecclesia, to stay grouped together, to stay in the gathering, life on life. And it can't be just Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock because you'll never make it. If it's just Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, you're never going to make it. I don't hate to be very bad news. But if you don't have connection to other people of faith, if you don't connect with people and say, man, can I just talk to you for a minute? Girl, can I talk to you for a minute? Whatever it takes, right? We have to be life on life every day because if we're not life on life every day, you're not going to make it and I'm not going to make it. Right? That is why the ecclesia is so important. That is how we stay hot for him. That is how we stay fired up for him. That's how we stay vibrant. And so with that, the Holy Spirit is given to each of us individually. We receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. But the only way to stay activated, the only way for that fire to stay activated is we've got to stay hot. We've got to stay part of it. We can't separate ourselves out. 
We can't be go separate. We can't because you go separate from the from the fire and you're going to burn out. That is the physical reality of a spiritual principle right there. You can't get away from the fire and stay hot for the Lord. You've got to stay hot for the Lord, especially in our time. So the expression of the kingdom of God really is life on life. It's building up each other together. It's supporting each other. It's cheering each other on. And Matthew 18, 20 says, Where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there also. It doesn't have to be Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. It could be any day of the week, right? Are you with me? It could be any day of the week. We gather on Sunday mornings, and hopefully we take out of here his agenda. And his agenda should be our agenda. He has an agenda for the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to change the lives of other people and restore their connection to God eternally is our agenda, and nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. He's here with us when we gather, and he's here with us when we scatter. And we're supposed to scatter. Remember where he says we're supposed to scatter? He said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Teach. Baptize. We're not supposed to just come together and hang out not as, as, as good as it is. Our purpose is to scatter. With a purpose. We are called to scatter. And Jesus made a promise in that scattering, Matthew 28, 20. He says, I am with you always, even to the end, end of the age. Always means in the worst of the bad days. Always is in that moment. Always is when things are good. Always is when things aren't so good. Always is when things are upside down. He's always there. I will be with you. Always. The question kind of becomes is, are you with me? I'll be with you. Are you with me? And this message sounds personal, but ultimately the church is who we are together, right? And so it, it, there's some personal one-on-one -on -one stuff that I think the, the Lord lays on us because we are his ecclesia, we are the gathering. But when you take the dynamic of what the church really is, it's not a building, it's not a program, it's not a social thing, it's not so we can get together and talk politics. It is about his gospel. It's about who we're supposed to be. It's about what we're supposed to carry out to others. And when we do that, we give him all access. Wherever we go, whatever we do, he is there with you. There have been times I go, I don't even know what to say, Lord. And I know people say to me, I don't know what to say to them. God will tell me what to say. If you put yourself in the position to say, God, whoever you send my way today, I'm going to talk to them for you. And say, I don't know what I'm going to say. He'll, he'll, he'll take care of it. He'll help you connect to that person in the way they need connected. But understand, only way we're going to change people's lives. Because there are people going, I'm not going to church. I, I won't go to church. And I will, stay. as a pastor, as a pastor, here's my success rate of asking people to come to church. You know what my success rate is percentage wise? 6%. If I was a basketball player and, and I only had 6% shooting, they'd take me off the court. Wouldn't <laughs> Guys? Probably take me off the court. Kegel, you're only hitting 6% of your shots. So as a pastor, inviting people to church, I'm only hitting 6% of the shots. You know what your shot percentage is? Because you're not a pastor and you invite people to church. When you invite friends to church, if you go to a friend and invite them to church, you know what your shooting rate percentage is? 82%. That means you're hitting 8 of the 10 shots you take when you invite someone to church. So yeah, preacher's job to invite people to church. I can invite people to church all day long. And if I don't stay covert, they know I'm a pastor. Like, yeah, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. This fine. I'll tell him I'll come. I'll tell him I'll come, but I ain't going to be there. But when you look at one of your friends in the eye, man, you ought to come with me. Because I think God can help you. He's helped me. You know what? You get eight of the ten shots you take. 
That's why you're kingdom priests. Because you can do it. And he'll be with you to do it. He'll tell you what to say. Acts 2.42 They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. If we want to get it right, go back to first intent. That was first intent. We make stuff too complicated sometimes. We make it about the building. We make it about the program. We make it about the service. We make it about the kind of music. We make it about the lights. We make it about whatever. And it's not about that. They devoted themselves continually, which means there was no let up when they left the building, to the apostles teaching the word of God, fellowship ministry, breaking of bread, worship, and prayer. Would you stand with me? I just want to get this right. I especially want to get this right because I see what you see. I talk about what you talk about. And what we see is that the world is falling apart, isn't it? But when we say the world is falling apart, that's a 10,000 foot comment. We can talk about the world falling apart, and it's easy to talk about that. Till you lower yourself down to ground level and see the people who the world is falling apart on. And the lives that are falling apart. And the way the devil is tearing them up. And why 30% of the population, as we sit right now that I know of, 30% of the population thinks it's so bad, they want to take their life. And ladies and gentlemen, that's just the kids. That's just the teenagers who have considered the better alternative than living this way is just to end it. And Jesus says, I've got a better way. But they need to hear from you. And they need to hear from me. So, what was the purpose of me saying all this today? The purpose of me saying all this today is, I just want to get this right. Are you with me on that? I just want us to be a fellowship that is totally devoted to the gospel of Jesus Christ that can change lives. It absolutely can, because I know it's changed a lot of your lives. It's changed all of our lives, right? Every one of us, it's changed. And that's all somebody needs to know. Let me tell you what I used to be like. And they go, wow, you used to be. That's all it takes. And God will do in you what you don't think you can do. He'll give you the words. He'll give you the wisdom. He'll give you what to say. He'll give you what to say it. He'll give you the grace to say it, the tenderness to say it. You don't have to be, jump all over somebody and be mean to them. It's not love. The grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Here's what I'd like for you to do this morning. Identify someone in your head that you know life is absolutely beating them up. And pray that God will give you that opportunity to share what he's done in your life with them so that they will know there's hope. Take a moment to do that. Father, we are so grateful to you. You loved us so much, you chased us down to change us. And for some of us, it's been more dramatic than others, but all of us have been the same. We were separated from you. And now we're back together with you through Jesus Christ. We're connected to you in salvation. And Father, you are changing us every day. And I pray that everyone in here sees that change that you're making in their life to know that you're with them. Lord, you're never going to leave them. You're never going to forsake them. And that you will help them see not to give up. To keep pressing on. To keep trusting you. Because your word says we can do that. Your word says you're with us. Your word says you have authority over the things that mess us up in life. And so, Father, we're asking in the name of Jesus that you will be with us and identify those things and help us. And, Father, help us help others. Put on our hearts those that you want us to come in connection with, to share with them that there's hope in you 
and there's help through you, and that the stuff that's really messing them up isn't the stuff in the physical, it's the stuff that can't see. And help us, Father, pray to those places to stop the devil from messing people over and stop him from messing over in our own lives and that as well. Father God, we are so thankful that you've, you've given us vision and you've given us a place that, that we can operate in our community. And Father, I pray that we'll use every opportunity you give us, every moment that we have, everything that you've given us, that we can make a difference here to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, to help people who are in desperate need of help. We love you. We thank you. We praise you, Father, for all that you do for us. We pray as we leave this place today, you will help us stay hot for you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hope you have a wonderful week.